Up next, we have Park and Diamond, Virginia, USA, Virginia Tech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Last year, over 85,000 Americans found themselves hospitalized with traumatic brain injuries as a result of cycling accidents. This cost the healthcare industry over $4 billion with an untold cost to their friends, families, and loved ones. We're Park and Diamond, and we're gonna change that. Last year, my sister was part of this statistic. She was riding her bike through the intersection of Park and Diamond when she was struck by a car in a hit and run. Since then, we are always left with the question, why would a college student who's investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in their education not wear a bike helmet? And it wasn't until we conducted over 235 interviews with the help and guidance of NSF's regional i program that taught us how to conduct interviews in a non-leading manner did we have our answers. The number one reason for why somebody doesn't wear a helmet is aesthetics. And there's no denying the fact that a big piece of gray foam on your head simply is an unattractive thing to wear. The second reason is comfortability. And as I say that, we probably all think at the time you want to go strap on your helmet and it pinched you under the chin. Or when you do have the helmet on and it slides across your head. Not only is it uncomfortable, it means the helmet doesn't fit properly, so it's not protecting you properly. And now the third reason is becoming even more important now than ever is cycling is relied on as a form of green alternative transportation, and that's portability. When you're biking to work, or to, to campus, you're left with the decision when you get off your bike to either leave the helmet on your handlebars where it could be stolen or affected by the weather, or you carry it all day in hand or have it take up your entire backpack or briefcase. These three key pain points have allowed us to target a market of over two million Americans. Now these are folks who commute frequently, frequently by bike and do not have a convenient location to store their helmet when they arrive at their destination. In fact, the cycling safety industry has been stagnant for the past 25 years. Designs have not changed since, my, since when my parents were in college, and I could say, at least speaking for myself, I wouldn't want to wear anything that they wore in college. At Park and Diamond, we're completely redefining the user experience for cycling safety products. As you can see, David is taking our helmet out of a water bottle, which shows exactly how portable and easy to assimilate in day-to-day -day life it is. Not only are we redefining portability, we're also redefining aesthetics. Our product is so thin that at five feet, it is nearly indistinguishable from normal headwear as a cyclist rides by. Now you may say, yes, the aesthetics of helmets have not changed much. Yes, they're uncomfortable and I don't like wearing one. And yes, the product development has not changed over my lifetime. But how do you know your technology works? How do you know that this product is safe? And the answer is in-house testing. We've invested significantly over the summer in a CPSC certified testing rig, which allows us to do all design and development in-house and know for certainty that our design works and we're putting our customers in the best hands. Another aspect of this design approach has led to many novel patentable aspects, including modular design, a reinforcing brim, a retention system, and point load distribution. We've been working with Nixon and Vanderhyde in Northern Virginia to develop a patent strategy which includes filing a series of provisionals that will be converted to full utility patents prior to product launch. This is the best way to get rock solid patents while maintaining affordability. Now our team of two engineers with an industrial design student consulting force would naturally want to focus on product development and product testing. Our team has over three years industry experience with product development, myself in the defense industry and Jordan in the automotive industry. And in addition, we place a, heavy, a very heavy emphasis on customer contact, customer discovery, and customer support. The reason for this is we want to know exactly what the customer likes, what they don't like, and what they want in a new product, and ultimately what they don't want in a new product. Because we're creating a product with the customer for the customer. Now there are certain responsibilities we want to outsource to experts. Our legal services have been handled by the Roanoke-based law firm, Woods Rogers, that we've had a working relationship with since we won a pitch competition they sponsored in the fall. Our third party independent testing will be conducted fr from C from SGS laboratories and they will be handling all of our CPSC testing. Plascore has been supplying us with all of our materials and now that we've completed our ma material selection process, we chose them to be our supplier for our helmet, for supplies for our helmet. Now Strategic Sports has extensive experience manufacturing athletic equipment, including athletic protective equipment, and we're relying on them to be our manufacturer. Marketing is an opportunity that could be fulfilled by a marketing firm, as well as now we're considering partnering with a rideshare program 
that could promote our helmet alongside their rideshare program. As for retail, we're going to tackle this with both online retail and brick and mortar retail in order to have our product distributed all across the country, as well as strategic partnerships with rideshare programs so we could utilize their millions of users. Now, a very recent and very encouraging recent development for us has been the material cost. It's actually lower than what we anticipated, and for only $7, we can have all the materials to make our helmet. And then, at a final cost of $30, we can have that helmet manufactured and assembled. We would have a 100% profit margin when we sell that helmet for $60 to rideshare programs and retail, and then we suggest a suggested retail price of $90. This leaves us competitive within the range of normal helmets, which range from $60 to $100, and also establishes us as a premium product. Now, the current competition for helmets consists both of conventional designs and unconventional designs. Conventional design is your typical bell helmet for $60. Unconventional designs, though, have always been unsuccessful in the past due to two main reasons. And the first reason is price point. Ranging anywhere from $150 to over $300, these helmets are simply priced out of competition. The second reason is CPSC testing. Many of these unconventional helmets are only for sale in Europe where they have not met the more strict US CPSC testing. So they simply cannot be sold in the US. So once we pass federal testing, we will be the only helmet that's competitively priced, has passed certification, and addresses all the user's pain points. Our company's financial outlook is incredibly strong. Not only are we going to deliver a successful consumer product to market, we're going to turn a profit in doing so. In fact, in our first year, we're going to do over a million dollars in revenue based on these three key sales channels. Localized brick and mortar retail to target commuters and college students, large box retailers to get mass market appeal, and recurring rideshare companies, which Dave will talk about in a moment. In our first year, we will build 19,000 units, which will total a little over the million in revenue. And in order to start this process, we'll need to raise $500,000 in the coming months to pay for tooling and the necessary costs. So a very exciting new opportunity for us is to partner with a rideshare program. Rideshare programs are owned in half by the city they're located in, and then the other half by a private company. And they like to purchase anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 helmets a year in order to give out as a form of promotion for their program. We met with a city official and purchaser of Philadelphia who said he'd like to purchase 1,000 of our helmets once certified, and in addition to this, he has contacts with other rideshare programs all across the country, including New York, Miami, Chicago, and LA. Not only is this a great way for a product launch, it's a great way for us to target a small group of clientele with a large volume of sales, thus minimizing unit cost. And in addition to this, it's a great way for us to utilize the private company's resources in order for them to promote and market our product so when a consumer sees our new unconventional helmet, they see a trusted large brand name company supporting us. Now the current objective for this quarter is to nail down our full utility patents. This then leaves us the freedom to approach any manufacturer that have our product manufactured so we have the inventory and the CPSC testing for next quarter. From there, at the start of 2017, in the spring, which is the start of the cycling season, we wanna hit the shelves. So when somebody takes their bike, their performance bike, to have it tuned up in the spring, they see our product on shelves. And then ultimately, with the success, momentum, and experience of a product launch in the cycling industry, we want to expand into the snow sports industry. This includes skiing and snowboarding helmets and offers a low barrier to entry because the CPSC regulations for a skiing and snowboarding helmet are exactly the same as they are for cycling. In addition to this, our target market is six times larger for skiing and snowboarding than it is for cycling. Our company outlook is incredibly strong. We have validated results, we're disrupting a stagnant market with patentable technology, and we're gonna do well by doing good. In fact, we're gonna do really well by doing a lot of good. Thank you. Do you wanna grab this one or you want me to grab it? I'll hold here. We've got a more recent prototype to show as well. Good job, guys. Can you, can you ha hand that around so we can just yeah, touch yeah, absolutely. it? And then um, CPSC, that's the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Yep. Is that the only federal agency that is in charge of certifying and testing? You guys go. Uh, yes, for, for the United States, that's true. There's also the Snell Organization. There, there are fair other ones that were started uh, with, uh, so essentially a similar situation where there was you know, a, a tragedy or something like that, and they decided to go out and try and develop a set of standards. Um, and like, so that's what the Snell organization is, for example. But the CPSC is the only certification you need to meet to, to bring a product to market. Mm -hmm. 
And before you have States. that, you cannot sell a helmet in legal, say it's a bike right. cycling helmet. Right. And then why start with cycling? Why not start with snowboarding? And that's due to timing. So if we would be able to launch in the spring at the start of the cycling season, we could then use that experience and that momentum to then launch two quarters later in around Christmas time for skiing and snowboarding. So what, what exactly is involved in that CPS uh, SC testing, and, and how long does that process take? So that's a great question. So the CPSC regulation stipulates that you do 12 drop tests in a, very, a variety of scenarios, which include submersion tests to prove that the material doesn't degrade in, uh, in like moisture, for example, or in the rain. Uh, so the exact regulation requires a drop less than 300 Gs. As you can see, our material is 226, so it's below the regulation. Um, and this is identical to what uh, any CPSC testing facility will have. We, uh, we developed this directly off the regulation. Uh, so, it would for, uh, so essentially the impact is 6.2 meters per second. It's 100 joules of energy. Um, the head form weighs five kilograms and it's an ISO uh, standardized head form size. You have to use SA certified accelerometers. And so there's a variety of costs involved for, you know, that we spent to effectively be able to say with certainty that we didn't have previously. And in addition, this greatly helps with product development timing. Rather than submitting a helmet, which would take about six weeks for them to conduct the test, then we'd ultimately get either a check or an X and we pass or don't. This way, we know definitively with this amount of energy and this force, right. we pass or we don't pass. And we've talked to SGS, and they said that a, as a turnaround time from the day that we give them the test samples, they could do it in a, in, in a matter of days. And it costs, I think the quote was $1,100 to the United States. It was like $870 to do it in China. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling, uh, w w you obviously have something in here which is hard, protective, right. but a helmet has to be, has to also give. So is that, uh, I guess, can you describe a little bit about the technology uh, Yeah, absolutely. Here? So what's interesting about the uh, energy absorbing material is that to the feel, regardless of what you would use, it feels firm because it's absorbing an, a high amount of impact. So 300 Gs is actually, uh, in, in our opinion, uh, not really essentially a good regulation because you would start to see severe um, brain damage around 80 Gs, right? So where like a football player starts seeing traumatic brain injuries is in the 80 to 100 G range. The regulation was actually written to prevent skull fracture and not to prevent um, concussions. We actually didn't have really any understanding of what concussions were and how repetitive concussions affect uh, your mental capacity in the future when the regulation was written in 1993. And we worked um, a little bit with Dr. Duma who does the, the Virginia Tech football research and she has, when we consulted with him about how uh, the structure of a helmet needs to be um, situated to protect someone and actually having a rigid body does nothing to protect, uh, does nothing to add to the protective qualities, pr particularly because foam has no shear uh, properties. It will just chunk apart. Um, and so that's why when we design the material, uh, we focus more on the energy absorbing aspect as well as preventing any stress concentrations from forming which would uh, create a skull fracture. And that's why we can essentially beat foam uh, at, you know, get similar protection for considerably less material. Which is actually one of our proprietary things we're now filing for utility pad is that point load distribution, which would assist in distributing right. the uh, force load. And, and it's not just implementing uh, an energy absorbing material. It's also how that interfaces with whatever's hitting it. That's the challenge. It's the reason why there's polycarbonate shells on helmets is that if you just had a, uh, a random object hit the foam, it could potentially puncture the foam or cause it to fail in a manner that would not absorb uh, sufficient energy to protect the user. And so that's, a, that's where a lot of the proprietary aspects of what we've been working on lies. Which, and we've, most of our materials sum, uh, submitted to Nixon and Vanderheide at the moment, we're you know, in the process. When do you think you can have your first MVP and how much money is it gonna take to get there? So that's a great question. So for us to get to an MVP or something that we could essentially put out and say this is protective would likely cost between 100 and 150 thousand dollars, and the challenge for us is that CPSC certification is on production lots; it's not on the design. So we would need to raise money to build the tooling, which we've consistently got quotes in the 80 to 100 thousand dollar range for the tooling. We have a deferred fee arrangement with our patent uh, with our patent attorneys, so we don't have to pay that money until we see over 250 thousand in revenue or outside uh, outside funding. And so, for us to get to that point, really the major cost is is the tooling and building the, the production units to get um, tested. We've, uh, when we spoke to the city manager and, and purchaser for the rideshare program in Philadelphia, they basically said, prove CPSC certification and we're good to go. 
Um, so for us to be able to actually start getting sales, once we prove CPSC certification, that's really gonna open the floodgates for us to go out and sell to these cities and, and other institutions. So how do you keep the helmet secure in case of an accident, you're thrown off your bike? So it, it has a strap, uh, just for the purpose of pulling it out of the water bottle. It's kind of hard with the microphone in your hand to, to actually right. strap it. Um, and that's, a, that's another aspect that unfortunately we can't discuss, which is why the strap's not complete. But we have a method so it won't pinch you and is secure. That's another part of the, the regulation. It's a head uh, retention test. It basically just smacks the head against the, an object and see if the, sees if the helmet falls off. So is there a risk that the helmet would be uh, misaligned when you when you have on impact right. somehow so that so it actually doesn't work the so way So actually an advantage with ours is we like to say it's one size fits most due to the athletic fabric it does a good job of uh, contracting to your head so rather than the 30 different circumferences of heads for normal helmets you'll have a much better comfort and much better fit to your head with our helmet which would result then in a better position in case of a fall or impact uh, would it be more secure than the ratchet system? Than the, the actual, what's on traditional helmets? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been working on is. Okay, so you're, ju you're just not there yeah. yet. Okay. Right, yeah. We so the other, then the other issue, I guess, too, is I don't know who you asked about the aesthetically pleasing, but <laughs> we'll leave that. Uh, ven ventilation, obviously traditional helmets uh, are ventilated. Any right. thoughts on that? Yeah, so actually one of the reasons why we're, actually, we're able to beat foam by such a significant margin is that we use a semi-permeable material that allows airflow through the helmet and by using uh, as athletic material we actually allow the airflow so as you can see on, on this helmet which is a twin one we bought at Walmart it's got these uh, these holes in it right and so part of the regulation are curbstone and spherical impactors and so the challenge with that is if you think about the spherical impactor hitting it right in the gap you need significant amount of foam on either side to protect the the user or the head form in this case on an impact machine and so because we have a material that's permeable we don't have to worry about that we can actually put some of an airflow through there Talk to us a little bit about how you would mitigate product liability risk. So once we pass CPSC certification, we'd be no more liable unless someone could prove that we fraudulently achieved the regulation. Um, the regulation is pretty much the only legal certification in the United States. There's a, a legal disclaimer um, with every helmet ship saying that you have to use this exactly the way you need to use it. If you drop it uh, before you use it, you can't use it anymore. It expires after five years. Um, so on and so forth. So just standard protocol. Right, the little pamphlet most people open, read once, and ignore. Okay, um, uh, questions from the audience here. Uh, how would such a thin product have the same protection as a normal helmet? Well, that's a great question. So the challenge with normal EPS foam, for example, is like I mentioned before, to get airflow, you need to have these gaps which, which bumps the thickness. The other challenge is the fact that this EPS foam is the same stuff that's been used for 25 years. We've come a long way since the 80s as far as material science is concerned, and so we're actually able to use a, a composite that can absorb considerable amount more energy in the same, in a uh, less of a thickness. Um, unfortunately, I can't disclose exactly how we do that because it's part of our, our patentable technology, um, but it's completely capable and does actually a better job, uh, significantly better job per thickness, uh, to the point it's like three times as good for the yeah. thickness, so we can, we can bump the thickness down. Okay, and why have people who have designed cycle helmets for their entire career not realized this obvious way to improve a clunky design? Cost, so the challenge was other incumbent companies, for example, almost all of them manufacture at the same manufacturer in China. It's something like, what, 60 or 70% of them all go through the same. In fact, most unconventional designs are manufactured by the same people in China. Mm -hmm. and they all use EPS foam, and so, the challenge is to move outside of that. Companies that are currently turning a profit selling something that doesn't have much product differentiation as far as protective factors, there's no profit motive for companies to make a safer helmet in the sense that there's no rating system. So actually that's where Virginia Tech comes into play as well, is that Dr. Juma and the, the Football Bioinformatics Institute is, I believe they publicly announced two days ago, um, which we've known for a couple months now, they're gonna release a helmet rating system similar to the IA, IIHS and other crash star ratings, what they've done for um, football helmets that will basically give a legal framework for companies to advertise how safe their products are. In fact, this like $30 helmet at Walmart or $40 helmet at Walmart is just as safe as a $300 one you could buy. The only technology that has improved safety has been something called MIPS, which the major cause of traumatic brain injuries is actually to the, st the stem of your spine. Um, and that's caused by rotational forces. 
And so the MIP system is just a thin piece of plastic that breaks away from the, the rest of the helmet that allows the helmet to rotate. Okay. Um, uh, the helmet, uh, this helmet bl blends in with normal hats. How can you protect users from not mistakenly using a normal hat and believing they are protected when they're actually more at risk? <laughs> <laughs> well, but, yeah. I think the strap might give it away. <laughs> that, that it, you know, it, it does blend in. So part of the design thought behind the strap was to try and blend it in as much as possible, make it look like uh, earphones or something, so that it's not something that really grabs your, your eyes. Um, yeah. And so that, that was kind of what we went for here. Uh, but maybe the design could work with men, with men but how is it going to accomplish for women uh, wearing this? So I guess it looks part of our very our aesthetic. Our <laughs> yeah, so part of our interview process with the, uh, the under the NSF's i -Corps, um, guidance was talking about like one-on-one -on -one interviews, right, for like half an hour, 45 minutes, hour, two hours, however much time someone was willing to give you. What we got a lot from women was they wanted a way that they could wear their hair up in a ponytail. Um, so that's something that we're going to work on as far as integrating a, a, a unit that would allow someone to do that. Any thought of also working with designers to create designer versions of these since it is just material and uh, on right. top of it? Yeah. S so actually an opportunity we have, we have a contact with the uh, design firm IDEO and as well as the consumer group Catterton. And we've had the suggestion of taking the approach of a very premium product. So partnering with somebody like a Louis Vuitton or like a very premium brand, which would convey trust in the safety aspect as well as give it a designer approach. So giving it more of a fashionable feel to it. Right, and so the reason why we've chosen, um, at least at this stage, to evaluate that approach, but also try and keep costs down as much as possible rather than going out and spending the most that we could on material, is that if we want to attack the rideshare market, the type of, the buyers for that market are not going to pay a super premium price, um, unless they're just raffling one or two away a year. So if we want to launch in that space, and, and we need to work on keeping the cost down, which is why it was incredibly exciting for us to come in with a with final assemble cost of $30. And our, our engineering uh, design philosophy is to design the chassis, right? You know, most cars you drive, there's a chassis and then there's the body, right? And so we're completely flexible, you know, the same way that, you know, a Lexus, for example, is just a nicer body on a Toyota chassis, that we could have that same approach here um, to, to essentially increase profit margins with, you know, fewer units for premium micro, uh, market. So along that vein, if the uh, regulatory bodies decided that they wanted to reduce that standard, I don't remember what it stood for, 300 down to 80, right? Mm -hmm. could you do something to the fabric or the material? Yep. Yeah, so absolutely. So there's a lot of variables that go into play when talking about how to optimize the design. That's really what we spent a lot of the summer doing. Um, so your material selection for that interface in between the energy absorbing and the whatever impact surface. Um, is one aspect where you can kind of tune how much energy gets dispersed over a certain area and then how thick of the material. Uh, the materials we use are manufacturable in any thickness. They're machinable. So we could change the design. The only thing that would be required is to us to go through that short part of the design iteration to once again optimize for a, a new thickness that we need, you know, say the regulatory body does change in like a year. And actually an opportunity that many people have presented to us is they said they would want something for their kids where aesthetics is less of an issue and they would want something more protective. And in that right. case, we could very quickly design something that focuses more on uh, protection, so perhaps involving a thicker one, but in less on aesthetics, so it's another market opportunity. Cool. Thank you.